Welcome back to the Schwab Network. We're watching equities gear up for a rally at the opening bell. Futures well bid, NASDAQ up percent. Crypto's up, gold's up. It's basically an everything rally. Bonds up too. Joining us, Lizanne Zahners is the chief investment strategist at Charles Schwab. Lizanne, uh, not a coincidence. We've got kind of an everything rally this morning after yesterday's message from Powell. It, it, well, the question is how long that can last. There are to some degree, strange bedfellows in um, some of the everything that is rallying when you see both stocks and bonds rallying and then gold rallying too. It, it seems like there might be some disconnects in terms of what the future trajectory of whether it's you know Fed policy or inflation expectations. For now, we've just got a, a lot of momentum that's driving markets beyond just the equity market. But, you know, last year was a year marked by grave concerns uh, on recession and earnings, and the market did well. And, and that may have been part of why the market did well, the whole notion of, you know, bricks in the wall of worry. I'm not a contrarian just to be a contrarian, but uh, the dismissal of any kind of risks on the, uh, you know, economy front, inflation front, future Fed policy front, uh, I don't know, gives me a, a little bit of a sour stomach. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of what Kevin was saying this morning. It's like, yeah, almost when it looks too good to be true, uh, it often can be. Uh, right. But until proven otherwise, I mean, we've kind of got both sides of the coin here with uh, the Fed. We've already seen the tech earnings kind of uh, firming up, turning around. Uh, when you look at the message yesterday, what was new in your mind? What constituted surprise from the FOMC? Well, it was it definitely leaned more dovish in the aggregate, and there had been some expectation heading into the meeting that you would see a change in the dots, suggesting only <clears throat> you know two cuts this year from three, and that didn't happen. So, on the margin, I would guess that's that's the the surprise. But <clears throat> we have to remember that Powell continues to reinforce data dependency, which means we continue to be at the mercy of the the data we we we've, we've all lived through the experience of the january through march period of going from a march start and six or seven cuts to now probably a june start and three cuts and that could uh change so i i don't think there was anything definitive maybe then other than ruling out what some had thought could possibly be another hike there was clearly some hope expressed that the january february pickup in inflation was more seasonal than anything else but we'll, we'll get a sense of that with the next print or two from an inflation uh standpoint and uh, i think that to the extent that that continues to show reacceleration in inflation it wouldn't surprise me to see See those expectations around the start point and the end destination for the year adjust. Mm. Now, as we uh, try and figure out how many times they're going to cut, the relevance for stocks, is it limited to small caps? Is it limited to companies without profits or big debt overhangs at this point? Because we're looking at this chart and as it's gone from seven cuts to three cuts, stocks have gone up too. Yeah, except that I think where you do see the needle move down the cap spectrum into the non-profitable companies, the zombie companies, uh, tends to be driven a bit more by what's going on in the bond market, not just Fed expectations in the short end. And, and whereas last year, you did have a direct inverse correlation between changes in, say, the 10-year yield and moves in the S&P and the NASDAQ. So it, it was up and down for the indexes, you know, yields up, stocks down, vice versa. This year, that correlation has remained pretty firmly negative, but it is more in indexes like the Russell 2000. So it's, it's down the cap spectrum where you see that relationship shift where if you in this otherwise you know trading range environment near term for the 10 year moves up have been to the detriment of those smaller cap names and non-profitable names the zombie uh, names it's having less of an influence on those cap weighted indexes because for the most part many of those uh, companies have heavy cap cash positions they're earning more interest on cash than they're paying interest on debt so it's just a, a bit more of a kind of a fine tooth on where where the hits from a Fed policy and bond yield reaction are, and it's into those lower quality companies. Mm, okay. So uh, right now they get a little extra uh, couple uh, weeks, a couple months maybe of, uh, of help from the Fed accommodation because we kind of pushed forward that cut ultimately by July into June. You know, we were kind of like 50-50 for June. Now that goes up to 70. It's kind of interesting that even though technically the dots took a cut off of next year. 
it pushed up the timeline for the first one here as far as the market sees it. Does that make sense to you based on what we heard? First of all, I, I think probably the most important thing that Powell said yesterday, and he says this at every pretty much every press conference, the dots plot is not policy. Mm -hmm. It's not a roadmap. It just references a moment in time when asked for their perspective, the various members, and then it's, you know, plotted. Um, and expectations around the start point uh, measured by things like, you know, the Sammy Fed watch tool that everybody's obsessed with, that literally can change on a dime. It can change mm -hmm. with any uh, data point. So I, I, I just think this idea that there is some set path and we can start to bank on the start point and how many, I, I just think that that's kind of a fool's errand because um, the the data could uh, could change that. You know, sort of worst case scenario, and this is this is not the the perspective that we have of what's going to happen. But clearly, worst case scenario would be for us to find that the reacceleration in inflation is not seasonal and it continues, but alongside it, you get weaker growth. You know, that's sort of the reverse Goldilocks environment, which I think would be worst case scenario. Uh, again, not not in the cards near term, but something to be mindful of, given that sentiment has gotten a bit uh, complacent, not just in terms of the trajectory for the Fed, but just in the stock market overall. Certainly. Feels like we're going to be embracing some of that uh, complacency here today, but we'll see. Um, when we look at the dependency of data, yesterday I kind of joked that it seems like maybe, uh, I guess the counterpoint to the dots not being a set plan would be that it seems like their independent variables maybe aren't quite as independent as I would have thought, Lizanne. I mean, two months of warm data, I guess that could be noise, but I mean, technically month over month, uh, like core figures, I mean, basically bottomed out last year. So, like, is Powell's window of noise pretty big? <laughs> um, what do well, you think? Well, you know, it's it's a good point because uh, on the subject of windows, we have to remember that more recently, Powell, although not yesterday, but more recently, he's been emphasizing, you know, longer term rates of change in inflation. And in that somewhat recent uh, 60 Minutes interview, he talked about the 12 month right. change in in various indicators. Now, for sure, the six and three month uh, change totally uh, in, in CPI, those have hooked, absolutely hooked up. You haven't quite yet seen in the 12 month, but you don't get relief on the three and six month. And you're going to start to see that at 12 month change tick up. And I think that would be uh, problematic. You, it's clear the Fed wants to cut this year at some point. They mm. just don't have the ammunition uh, yet, either in terms of where inflation is, uh, even their own slightly more tame favored metric of PCE. Um, but the what they're looking for in the labor market is not quite there yet. Yeah, you know, Powell focused on quits yesterday. I have trouble with the pointing going always back to the jolt related data, whether it's job openings or, or quits. First of all, that, that data lags all other labor market data by a month. And the response rate for the jolt survey has been cut in half over the past 10 years. So I'm just not sure that we should be hanging our, our hat so uh, significantly on that type of data as a measure of labor market tightness. I, I think mm -hmm. it can be part of the collection, but it has to be a collection. Mm, very interesting. Uh, OK, uh, what's the next thing you look for here, Lizanne? Kind of last uh, point is uh, we were looking for, uh, you know, inputs. Uh, do we just, I guess, next PCE print? Uh, to PCE, see, yeah, yeah, PCE print and all the, you know, the, the innards of that headline core, PCE core services, X shelter, which has been a focus of the, the Fed. You don't tend to get big outliers with PCE because essentially you have the inputs with CPI and PPI. But um, we're in that fine tooth comb uh, phase of, of really digging into these numbers to get a sense of the trend. OK. All right. Uh, so it seems like business as usual. We're back to back to business until otherwise noted. And the business has been pretty bullish. Yeah, it's been <laughs> bullish, but still a lot of churn and rotation under the surface, which, by the way, isn't a bad thing. Um, that That's not a bad way to kind of correct some excesses to have rotation under the surface. You just wouldn't necessarily pick that up by keeping your focus solely on the cap weighted indexes. All right. We're watching to see if that Russell can churn its way through 2100. Thanks, Lizanne. Great conversation. Good to see you. Appreciate it very much. Lizanne Saunders, chief investment strategist to Charles Schwab.